Great. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. Uh, review six. The week I reviews 100 point rating scale. So I realize this video probably needs some context. Last weekend, I performed my review of John Green's The Anthropocene Reviewed live in London. And while most of it exists solely for the people who were in that room, something I'll be talking about more in depth in a video coming up soon, I did record this one section, Review 6, about my review scale because it is something that a lot of people have asked me about. And uh, I figured if I was going to let any of the world see any part of this, uh, this is the one that they would see. So uh, enjoy, I guess. I'm sorry my hips moved so much. I had been standing for several hours at this point. It sometimes feels like review has become a dirty word on the internet in general and on YouTube in particular. One that is synonymous with vapid bullshit done by people whose critical faculties shouldn't have gotten them through middle school. And I can understand why, but I still chose to put review in the name of my YouTube channel because I believe in the value of the word. Like, not to be hella pretentious, but I do think that many of the issues are a direct result of the democratization of criticism. In the olden days, we had professional critics in newspapers and magazines and the like, and you pretty much knew what to expect from them. Nowadays, not so much. And that is both fantastic and terrible. In text, I think there are basically two types of reviews, which I will oh so reductively describe as breakdown and criticism. But once you go audiovisual, there is at least a third, which I will call the summary. Let's consider all three. The breakdown is what I did for the first several years of my critical existence. Separate a work into its component parts and focus on the individual at the expense of the whole. Maybe there will be an overview of the plot, maybe it will just be the entire sequence of events laid out in dry prose, but in either case there is minimal attempt at understanding any of it. What it is trying to do. Why it's trying to do it. A breakdown considers a work not as art, but as product. Something to be physically rather than intellectually dissected. There are obvious reasons why this would be ideal for a writer. The most significant being that it's fucking easy. Intentionally missing the forest for the trees makes your job super simple. And there's a sort of logic when it's applied to game reviews specifically. Like, I don't think you should individually consider each component of an experience, gameplay, story, graphics, sound, etc. But I understand the impulse. When I was a dumb baby writing about Resident Evil 4, I gave it a 10, and that was fine, but that 10 was fundamentally different than a 10 pretty much anywhere else because it was sort of mathematically determined. You see, while GameSpot has switched to a more standard format in recent years, back in the day a score was actually an average of individual scores given to its components as well as a nebulous tilt that was the only acknowledgement of any humanity behind this. The rest was presented as cold calculation, the illusion of objectivity. And to that point, most reviews that proudly proclaim their objectivity would fall under the breakdown banner, which is to say, they are basic, boring bullshit. Criticism acknowledges the components of a work naturally, while understanding that it isn't necessarily the sum and certainly isn't the average of its parts. They're less concerned with plot than theme. When events are discussed, it's because they exemplify some broader point the critic wants to make and not because a checklist requires their inclusion. As my writing shifted away from games and towards the much more established critical world of film, my own shortcomings there became very clear. And ever since, I have made it my mission to engage on a more than surface level, to be a critic. At a bare minimum, I want my attempts at understanding a work to help you consider yours. And if I can't do that, I should just delete my channel and live my boring life offline. But there is a problem. The canon. Which I'm using here to mean the base set of experiences with the art form that someone must have to be good at their jobs. Professional critics have stupidly vast wells from which they can and do draw. Basically nothing is new, which means everything can inspire comparison to the history of that or frankly any other medium because a good critic will know more than just their own. Done well, this helps contextualize a work, gives informed readers, etc., a dopamine hit when they understand the references, and provides uninformed readers, etc., a place to start on their journeys towards informedness. Done poorly, 
you run into the Boss Baby problem, where someone who has only ever seen the Oscar-nominated film The Boss Baby turns around and gets serious Boss Baby vibes from Citizen Kane because it also centers on a man-child in a suit trying to overcome his daddy issues and become the most important person in the world through mischief. I assume I haven't seen Citizen Kane. <laughs> I haven't seen most things I probably should have. It's why I tend to couch my comparisons in caveats. I know a lot about modern Korean cinema for a white guy. That was honestly more true in 2018 than it is in 2022. But you know, when I started writing about Korean cinema in 2011, after only having seen a half dozen films, most of which were directed by Park Chan-wook, I said some really dumb shit about the industry. I needed to get educated so that I could be educational. But at the same time, I don't want to read a fucking bibliography to understand a review, and I'm not trying to make reviews that need them either. This is why I have so much difficulty getting through academic work in particular. Every few lines is a reference to another paper or book that I haven't read, and I get why in the abstract, but in practice, it feels like they don't want plebs like me to engage, and that sucks. Although it's not written academically, I felt real heckin' uneducated while reading The Anthropocene Reviewed. Some of this is a function of age. John Green has been around longer and has had more time to ingest things, and also that's more of his literal job than it is mine. But I'm 30 now, and I can't really hide behind youth anymore. Take, for example, poetry. Green quotes poems in nearly a quarter of the reviews included in this book. And every single time, I felt a twinge of frustration, because I don't get Poetry, which it goes back to the whole metaphor thing I was talking about before the break, I can put all of the internal rhymes I want into my rap songs, but those punchlines that the art form excels at are beyond me. I want to read more literature and poetry. I want to understand academic texts and fill in the massive gaps in my knowledge of cinema and television and music and video games and everything else that I talk about on YouTube and in my life. But when it comes time to do that, I don't. TikTok taught me that executive dysfunction is a thing, and it sure does sound like me. I have always found serious attempts at self-education paralyzing, because it's ultimately a zero-sum game. There is a finite amount of time that I have, and I don't know how to spend it well. Every video essay I watch is a series of poems I didn't read. Every video game I play is a handful of movies I didn't see. Every TikTok binge is an online course I did not take to better myself or do any of the other things I just listed, though it's the thing I'm most likely to end up doing, while a voice in the back of my head calls me an imposter whose only expertise is in his own narcissism. And is the voice wrong? I talk about me all the time, both because I like talking about myself, and because I am the one subject that I know I'll get right. Or at least, the one that no one can reasonably tell me I got wrong. The focus on myself might be a part of why people sometimes call what I make video essays. And certainly meaningful criticism on YouTube is often presented in that format, but it's not the only way to engage with the work meaningfully. The difference between the two is largely a matter of framing. A review focuses critically on a subject, while an essay focuses critically on an idea. You can make a review of the Batman that talks about how the character's legacy resulted in this specific Batman, and you can make a video essay on, the ba on Batman in general that talks about how the Batman fits into the character's legacy. And the text of the two can be largely identical, with the emphasis on different syllables, and that's great. A review can be every bit as critically rigorous as an essay. It should be, though by virtue of focusing on one subject, it'll likely be shorter, unless you're me and talk about inside for an hour, or CJ the X and do that for two and a half times as long. <laughs> but I get the desire to shun the word review because it has been so thoroughly bastardized on this platform, specifically by the rise of the summary, which is to say the thing but shorter and with some color commentary thrown in. It's commentary in the YouTube sense of the term. Channels breaking down movies and TV shows the exact same way they break down apology videos. Brief explanation, lengthier demonstration, ultra-brief commentation. Now, I wouldn't really call these homages to the Nostalgia Critic reviews, but I'm also not willing to fight to the death over it, even if I'd probably win. Interestingly, scores are a relatively recent addition to media criticism. While Michelin stars have existed since the invention of the automobile, ratings weren't applied to film until the 1950s and didn't become widespread until the internet age. To John Green, the five-star scale doesn't really exist for humans. It exists for data aggregators. 
Making conclusions about quality from a review is hard work for artificial intelligences, whereas star ratings are ideal for them. I disagree on a few points. For example, the tomato meter, not an AI. It's barely an algorithm in the massively complex way that we tend to think about them nowadays. But also, the idea that they're meant for computers grates up against the fact that they've existed since before computers. But I understand what he's getting at. A review score is a TLDR of a TLDR, not so much distillation as punctuation. When Green started writing reviews for Booklist, he had 175 words to work with, which is paltry but still allows for near infinitely more nuance than a simple number ever could, no matter how many decimal points it goes to. He is also right that the sometimes controversial decision to use ratings and what ratings to use often comes down to aggregation. Whether star, number, thumb, or letter, you will want something easily ingestible into Rotten Tomatoes or Metacritic or whatever, because if you are not aggregated, do you even exist? By that metric, my former critical home kind of didn't and kind of still doesn't. Flixus.com editor-in-chief Matthew Razak was already a Rotten Tomatoes-approved critic when he co-founded the site. But as far as the aggregator is concerned, it is a one-man operation and not itself tomato meter approved. Still, when Matt linked his early Flixist reviews there, he introduced likely the most rigorous scale to have ever been included in their ranking, or possibly anyone else's, one so ridiculously precise that when the site was founded in 2010, I wrote and subsequently did not send an email complaining about it. I've never been so glad in my fucking life that I didn't do something. What, you might ask, could have inspired such fury? A 200-point scale. 0 to 10 base, with the option for not just one, but two decimal points, adding a potential 0 .05 for when you really just can't decide between a 7.2 and a 7.3. Now, the reason I was so irritated was actually because the first review guide implied a 1,000-point scale, but even 200 is fucking absurd, which is why, when I became the reviews editor at Flixist in 2013, my first act was to have the number of options on the scale. Now, I understand why that system would appeal to the man who created it, someone who ranked every single movie he's ever seen against every other one. Like, I wasn't a part of those discussions, but I wouldn't be shocked if he literally wanted a 1,000-point scale and they talked him off a ledge, compromising with the point zero five. His concern that when too many films get a 7 or 7.5 or even 7.3, the number is robbed of meaning, is not invalid. And it fit with the ethos of the parent company, Modern Method, which owned Destructoid, Flixist, and two other outlets before they were all acquired by Enthusiast Media in 2017. Review scales for its sites followed the fervent belief that an average project deserved an average score at the center of the scale, i.e. a 5 out of 10. Problem is, in the American grading system, 50% is a failure, 75% is average. And so we've all got this sort of mental rejection of scores that should mean above average, and that's a problem because why would you want more ways to say you didn't like something than to say that you did? It's dumb. But Flix's implementation of this idea was particularly strict, pushing ideas closer and closer to the center by sheer force of language. According to the original review guide, a 9.0 out of 10 was literally perfect. If you wanted to change a single frame, it was an 8.95 at best. A 9 was perfect, one of the best movies you'd ever see. A 9.5 changed the way you viewed cinema, and a 10 changed cinema itself. Which is to say, it could really only be done in retrospect. And I liked a lot of that. I obviously removed the perfection requirement, but I largely kept the rest in place at Flixist and brought that over to the Week I Review, making only two tweaks to 5.0 and 10. This is what a score on the Week I Review means. Zeros are insulting. Ones are repulsive, twos are terrible, threes are bad, fours are subpar, a 5.0 is something I love and hate in equal measure, while the others are flavors of average, sixes are decent, low sevens are good, high sevens are very good, low eights are great, high eights are exceptional, and the nines mean what I said before, lows are among the best things I've ever experienced, highs change the way I viewed their art forms, and tens, they're like porn. I know them when I see them, right? And sadly, I'll never see as much of one as the other. Sometimes I know exactly what a score will be when I go into the writing. Others, it's just a vague idea. 
I know that it's good, so that means it's somewhere between a 7 and a 7.4, but it may change. Maybe it's very good, pushing it up slightly. Maybe it just misses the mark and drops down to a decent of 6.9. When I started the channel, I was actually using multiple scales simultaneously. My first score was not, in fact, the 8.5 that I gave creating a YouTube channel. It was 4.75 stars given to the app one second every day, which I had stopped using about six months before I decided to make a YouTube channel, which is not a coincidence. Back then, I thought that any time I mentioned a subject that I had feelings about within the context of any other review, I should score it. And I did try that, albeit inconsistently, in my first five videos. But aside from being more shit I had to keep track of, it was doomed to fail when I decided that each other thing should be scored its own way, because when I wanted to give the Samsung Galaxy S8 3.5 out of 5 Wi-Fi bars, it was really hard to make it look good, and, and I, I didn't. I didn't make it look good. And I'm, I'm realizing now that I should have just used fucking cell, cell phone bars. Fuck, that would have been so much easier. <laughs> Whatever. Point, point is, I'm not graphically minded. This was a dumb joke, and I was fucking over it, right? I thought about this thing that I tried to do when John Green had added a little footnote to the Anthropocene Reviewed's copyright page, wherein he gives the typeface four and a half stars, and then again shortly after, when the concept of a half title page receives two and a half stars. But Green, like me, gives up on this pretty quick, as future footnotes serve functionally the same purpose as my asides, or the text things that appear and then disappear ever so slightly faster than anyone would like. Still, his implementation was better by virtue of these little blurbs using the same scoring system as every other review. John Green likes stars, how they're applied to hotels and movies and public restrooms and his OCD medication and a bench in Amsterdam upon which a scene of the movie adaptation of The Fault in Our Stars was filmed. Anything and everything can be given a star rating, and his book is evidence of that. I immensely respect Green's decision to rate things like humanity's temporal range and whispering and plague. It makes me feel like a coward for not giving being vaccinated a nine point something or separating art from artists a straight five. What would I have scored turning 30? I literally never thought about it. I should have worked harder to come up with scores for Getting the Bag and Resurrection of the Little Match Girl, but also there are times when feelings can't be reduced to numerics, and definitely not ones as precise as my review scale. I want these numbers to mean something, and any number I assigned to the experience of the labyrinth of cinema would ruin the meaning of that number forever because it would be a lie. If you chart the scores, you see that N.A is tied with 8.5 as the most common, followed closely by 9.0, 8.4, and 7.9. And it is interesting that they're all kind of cusp scores. The median is 8.2, and the average is slightly above 7.8. And perhaps that means those numbers are meaningless. Part of the modern method argument is that a proper score distribution would look like a bell curve, with most of the subjects being placed right there in the center. But the problem with that conception is that no one is, or frankly should be, reviewing every single thing that exists. Yeah, with a large enough sample size, you will see more and more mediocre things fill out the center. But we all have to make choices about what we're going to review. January actually lowered all of the numbers I gave you because I saw more things that I was kind of eh on that I would have never reviewed otherwise. As a rule, I rarely review things I don't like because why would I? It's not my job to see and do everything. Hell, it's not my job to see or do anything. So if I don't think I'm gonna like something, I don't bother with it. And when I do experience something that I don't like, I rarely feel compelled to do more than dash off an annoyed tweet about it. So my distribution is all on the high end because that's the stuff I wanna tell you about. And even if that meant every single score on my channel was an 8.5, it would still mean something each time that I said it. And in any case, it all gets put on the same leaderboard. I may have given 13 8.5s and 12 9.0s, but you can see how I felt about them compared to each other. And even though I didn't give separating art from artists that 5.0, I did put it smack dab in the center of the four subjects that I have. But while the scores never change, the placement of subjects does. Every so often, I will reorganize, which is how an 8.3 like Anna and the Apocalypse can end up ahead of an 8.7 like Agretzko, We Wish You a Metal Christmas. And I like that. And I do think it's a little unfortunate that you lose the context with an NA rating, 
But at the same time, if you really want to know how I felt about something, you can watch the review. I give the Week Air Reviews 100 point rating scale three and a half stars.